When we say charge on, From the University of Santa Florida, beautiful Rosen campus in the city beautiful of Orlando, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Abraham Pizam Distinguished Lecture Series. I am Dr. Robertico Crows, Associate Dean for Research and Administration. We honor Dr. Abraham Pizam founding Dean of the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. 50 years ago, he achieved his PhD and the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series will take a look at the evolution of the hospitality and tourism industry through the eyes of some of the pioneers and doyens in this field of education. The Dean's Le Distinguished Lecture Series will conclude in April, 2021. For those of you who attended our first three lectures with Dr. Jafar Jafari on October 23rd, Dr. Ari Reichel on November 13th, and Dr. Brian King on December 10th, thank you for taking time out and being here today. For those of you who attend our distinguished lecture series for the first time, welcome. Today we have another interesting lecture and at this time, I would like to say good morning to my co-host, Dr. Alan File. Good morning, Alan. Lovely, good morning, Tika. Good morning, everybody. Anna, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I'm sure I can speak for many. I did a business degree. I did a retail master's. I did a tourism PhD, all in marketing. So I've always followed your work and pr probably more than any of uh, the other speakers we have had so far, I've probably cited you more uh, than any of the others. So uh, I know your work is excellent and I'm sure the audience today uh, will, will appreciate your, your input and your advice in terms of publishing. So thank you very much for joining us, albeit virtually. For everybody listening, uh, welcome. We've got a really good number this morning, which is great. Um, once Dr. Matilla has given her presentation, we will have about 15 minutes at the end uh, to, to offer and uh, receive some questions. So please submit your questions in the Q&A zone, not the chat zone. chat zone. Please put them in the Q&A zone and we'll take it from there. So Dr. Matilla, thank you very much indeed. Your work is excellent. Thank you. Dr. Thank you, very, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good evening for some of the college. You might be somewhere in the, in the world. So welcome to the Rosen College, of course, virtually to be with us uh, for this uh, Dean's uh, Distinguished uh, Speaker Series. Um, uh, today is a very, very interesting day, uh, as I would like to describe it. You know, this is the first day after a peaceful transition of power. Uh, in the in the in in DC, you know, so we're grateful to uh, to that. And of course, you know, it's a new year, happy new year, everybody. New semester and new direction, uh, I guess, right? And a new speakers. So we have a wonderful speakers for the rest of the semester, and today we have, you know, uh, one of them. So as uh, Tico and Alan mentioned, that you know, this uh, speaking series is set up to uh, honor uh, Professor Abraham T. Pizam. Uh, for his re remarkable scholarship uh, achievement. Uh, so today, actually this year marks his uh, 50, uh, 50th year after he got his uh, uh, PhD. Um, so for many of you probably, uh, Abe is a person who does not need any uh, introduction. Um, but you know, if I can use a few words to describe Abe, Abe as, uh, as a scholar, as a colleague, 
Um, um, I would use the uh, architect, innovator, mentor, leader, and obviously scholar. Um, so uh, Abe, you have been an inspiration for, for many of us here, and you are the best example for sustained uh, excellence in scholarship. Uh, we have a short bio for, for Abe, just for those of you who do not know uh, Dr. Pizam very much. Uh, Dr. Pizam is the founding dean uh, from 2000 to 2018 of Rosen College of Hospitality Management at the University of Central Florida. Uh, so currently he serves as professor and Linder Chapin eminent scholar chair in tourist management. Professor Pisam is widely known in the field of hospitality and tourist management and has, has conducted research projects, lectured and served as a consultant in more than 30 countries. Uh, he has held various academic positions in a number of countries internationally and has authored more than 250 publications of which uh, 180 of them were scientific publications, and he also published uh, 10 uh, books. His publications have resulted in more than 20,000 citations and generated H index of 66. Uh, he's editor uh, emeritus of the International Journal of Hospitality Management, one of the leading journals in our field, and serves on the editorial boards of 26 academic journals. Uh, Professor Pizam has conducted consulting and research projects for a variety of international, national, and regional tourism uh, organizations. Um, so we are so grateful today that, you know, uh, the speakers uh, series today is supported by another great uh, scholar uh, in the tourism hospitality research community, uh, Professor Anna Matilla from the School of Hospitality Management at uh, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, Anna, has been a friend of, of, of Abe for many years. Uh, so I'm gonna give the floor to Abe to have an introduction of uh, Professor Anna Matila. So I hope that you will enjoy the session and uh, we'll have some interactions at the end of the session. So thank you very much. Abe, please pick uh, up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Wang and welcome everybody. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me personally to welcome uh, Dr. Anna Matila. Uh, we have known each other for many years. Uh, I wouldn't mention how many uh, <laughs> for uh, the, the sake of, of keeping us all young, uh, but uh, Dr. Matila is not only a top researcher, a prolific author with more than uh, 200 uh, articles with 24,000 plus uh, citations with an age index of uh, 78. But most importantly, she is a pioneer and a trailblazer. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote an editorial which was followed by an article called From Rodney Dangerfield to Aretha Franklin. I was trying to list the history of hospitality and tourism management as a field of study throughout the years when we started being the Rod Rodney Dangerfield, who is who was an actor whose stick was, I get no respect. So that was the story of hospitality and tourism management for many, many years. But over the years, we moved away from that particular position and became what I called Aretha Franklin, the famous uh, singer whose song is R-E-S-P-E-C-T. We got the respect. <laughs> and one of the persons, the pioneer, who started getting the respect from other fields and exported the culture and philosophy and practices of hospitality into service management was none other than our friend here, Dr. Anna Matilla. So for that, we are forever in your debt because you were the one who showed to the rest of the world that not only we are equal to them, but even better than them. 
that we manage now to export our knowledge and skills and philosophies into the field of service management. And how do I come to that conclusion? Because a very large portion, if not the majority, of her publications were done in non-hospitality and tourism journals that have a very high rate of uh, rejection. And she managed to break that glass ceiling and showed to the world that we hospitality and tourism researcher are as good as anybody else, if not better. So with great pleasure and distinction, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Matilla, the pioneer and the trailblazer in our field. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you. That was really lovely. So today I'm very happy to be here and share my presentation with you. I'm going to be talking about the publications in today's and, and tomorrow's publications seen in hospitality and tourism research. So I'm gonna share with you my, uh, my slides. So just hold on a sec. Okay, so now you should be able to see them, right? Yes. Okay. So first I want to just uh, <clears throat> give my homage to Dr. Pizan. It's incredible that he was an editor of the, of the premier journal in, in our field for so long. And he's the one who should be given the credit for that incredible impact factor of 6.7. That's really, really mm -hmm. wow, a wow factor. So today's game plan. I'm going to talk about what is good research, at least in my opinion, how to be productive, what, is the, what are the impact me metrics that people are looking at, then the idea of open access journals and online data collection platforms, and then I finish with the review issues. So a lot of these topics are coming from my, from my own research, what I've been doing as a scholar, and also my 20 plus years of mentoring doctoral students. So what is good research? In my mind, there are four really important criteria. Good research is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, whichever way you define those terms. It has to have a scholarly mandate. Have, it has to have broad relevance and of course of high quality. And high quality implies more than just rigor, but also replicability. Because if you can't replicate your studies or your, re your research findings, that is no good. So I think that replicability is a huge issue. So as <clears throat> Dr. Pisa mentioned, my, my, my home field is really consumer behavior. And if you look at consumer behavior, it is a very interdisciplinary idea. Because we consumer behavior, you look at from finance perspective, from neuroscience, from history, from marketing, from economics, communications, psychology, anthropology. So it really captures an awful lot of other fields. But my question to you is, could we replace the consumer behavior box here with hospitality and tourism? I think we could, because we are looking at our topics from very different perspectives, depending on who's looking at the issue. So I think that's a very, very, important idea to keep in mind. that We are very interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary as well. Obviously in today's world, there's so much pressure to publish. The bar is getting higher and higher. And this puts a lot of pressure on doctoral students and junior faculty. It is really, really getting very hard to publish in top tier journals. So how can you be a productive writer? Because publishing is all about being able to write, keep producing. Obviously the, the first thing is to make a schedule. Unless you plan things, writing doesn't happen. It's just like exercise. Unless it's planned, it doesn't happen. You want to set realistic goals. There's no need to disappoint yourself. Set goals that you can reach and then you feel good about writing. Keep track of your work. Reward yourself for the progress you're making, the article that you finish. Whatever that reward is for you, is it a piece of, of chocolate cake or is it a cocktail, whatever it is, 
you know, make sure that you reward yourself for, reward, for the progress you've done. Obviously, you need to build good habits because habits are the driver of being productive. And most importantly, you need to use time efficiently. Time management, in my opinion, is really a key to productivity. So where should you publish? Obviously, we all want to publish in high impact journals because you want to look at that return on investment that you put into writing. Because those, those high impact journals like the IGHN, are, you're more likely to be cited if you publish in such journals. It's also increasingly more important for external funding, which is required in many, many institutions now. For example, I'm in the College of Health and Human Development where external funding is expected. So if you don't have high impact, impact citations, you won't be able to get external funding. And then as Dr. Pizan mentioned, this is a philosophical question. Do you want to publish in top tier hospitality or do you want to go out of hospitality and branch out to the mainstream? I decided to do the dual track and that keeps me busy. Obviously, the authorship issues are something that every, every academic, academic person considers. And these uh, should be decided at the beginning of the project because they, like, authorship issues can become very thorny issues later on. Many friendships have been lost over authorship issues. So what is the criteria to, for claiming an authorship? Obviously, you should be a, there should be a substantial contribution to the conceptualization or data analysis. The author who, who's listed as an author should be a leader in the intellectual content and should agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work because that accuracy or integrity of the research project is very, very important. Obviously, in today's world, we have these multiple co-authors. Solar pieces are the, are the thing of the past and understandably so because you know there's so much pressure to publish. It is not only more, more efficient to publish with others, but it's also more fun. But then what is the relative contribution of each cohort? If you ask what is your contribution, you ask everybody, all of a sudden, it's well over 100%. Because there's that self-serving bias in any teamwork. People claim more than they, what, what they actually contributed. And another thing is that if you don't, if, you, if someone doesn't deserve to be an author on the, on the piece, but they help you somehow, I think it would be very, very, very nice to acknowledge help from others in writing. So just put the little acknowledgement here. Thank you for the help of blah, blah, blah. You know, there's no need to be selfish here. So one of the big questions that all academics struggle with, especially at the beginning of their careers is how to develop a cohesive narrative to showcase intellectual leadership. Because promotion and tenure is really about that. Can you claim to, to show your intellectual leadership? Obviously, one important thing is your impact. And Google Scholar citations are there. It's a very simple, easy way to keep track of your citations. And this is actually from my Google site. So it gives you your citations, your age index, and your item index. And these are increasingly used in a, for external reviews in, P, in the PMT process. So it is important to keep track of your Google Scholar citations. And the age index, that was introduced by Hirsch in 2005. It's an index to quantify an individual scientific research output. And the advantage of this index is that it isn't skewed upwards by a small number of really highly cited papers. But there are some disadvantages as well. It can be skewed by self-citations. And most importantly, the, these indices are not comparable across disciplines. For example, if you look at our, our age index values versus engineering, those are strikingly different. So it's important to keep that in mind. You can compare within the, within the same, same uh, research discipline, but not across. So self-citations, I really think you should be careful with those. However, they are there. The self-citations, an increasing number of self-citations is the unintended effect of the pressure to publish. Because you really need to have you show those metrics in order to survive in the academic career. 
but I'm very cautious when I see too many self citations. I'm like, uh, where are we going with this? There are other ethical challenges. You know, some of the exercises that are reported might be inflated due to the researchers' degrees of freedom. You know, researchers are sometimes selectively omitting studies or conditions to make the results look better. Or they are selectively using covariates again to, to increase the statistical power. Or they are selectively removing cases again to make significance values go get better. So these are the ethical challenges that I think we as an academia should we should be very cautious about. Now, should you consider open access journals? I mean, it's a nice idea because open access uh, journals, they provide access to high quality peer reviewed journals. They are free of charge, all data is freely available. So there are lots of advantages. And currently in this directory of open access journals, there are 47 hospitality journals and 133 tourism journals. So maybe this is the way to go in the future. However, they do charge a fee to publish. So who should pay for that fee? In our field, we don't have those huge research grants that we could just pay for thousands of dollars to publish in these open access journals. So is it the institution's responsibility or the individual's responsibility? So that is an open question that I don't think we really have a good grasp on yet. But there's an increasing demand for transparency. So more and more journals are requiring the authors to do the research data deposit. So that's it, they can be encouraged or it can be required where you have to, to do the data deposit and linking. And then in an the extreme case, the research data is peer reviewed prior to publication. Obviously the hospitality and tourism is not, academia is not there yet, but this is the way I, can, I see things going because transparency is so important. Another way to make things more transparent is to, to do pre-registration of studies. And this is really simple. It can be a one page document answering really basic questions, such as what questions will be studied, what are the predictions, what data will be collected and how will the data be analyzed. It does not preclude generating new hypotheses. However, it does avoid hacking, which is hypothesizing after results are known. And here's just one example of these pre-registration out, outlets. As predicted, that's by, the, by UPenn, the working school. If you, if you do the pre-registration there, you get an email from the, from the, from the robot Larry who tells that, yeah, you got your, your, your study is pre-registered. But this is becoming more and more important and more expected in, in, in the mainstream. Now, a lot of editors are wondering about the MTurk crisis. MTurk is a great way to collect data fast. However, there are data quality issues. One of the problems is that there are these bots. They are semi or fully automated codes to automatically respond to surveys. Another problem is international IP addresses we, because they, they might not be able to respond to your survey questions the way you expect. So what can you do? What are the rem some remedies to data quality issues? The typical instructional manipulation checks are problematic. You know, saying for quality purposes, choose five for this question. These are easily recognizable to professional survey takers. So those are not effective anymore. So the, you, you need to come up with better measures. For example, you can ask the, the year of the, the person was born at the beginning and then age at the end. If the two don't match, obviously there's something wrong. In order to avoid the, the international IPA addresses, an easy thing is to just ask them to select the state and city of residence. This throws off a lot of people. And you want to make sure that it's not some kind of a robot thing. And one thing that I've been using more and more is open-ended questions. I give people a little paragraph to read, and then I ask them what was the main, main idea in that paragraph? Because the robots and the people who are not really paying attention don't really pass that question. And lastly, you can, uh, 
you can subscribe to services such as the IP Hub to weed out fraudulent respondents and then block them from ever getting back to your service. But there, there is a problem with the with MTurk, and it's very frustrating when you have to throw out like 20, 30 percent of your data. But there are other platforms. MTurk is not the only one. Prolific is another one, and they they. they take 33% commission on, a, on a, each person's response, but MTurk does 40%. They have 40,000 active participants and they tend to be no more naive than MTurkers. In MTurk about the super workers, which are, represent 5% of the top 5%, they complete 40% of the tasks. So there's a lot of people who are doing this almost for, as a job. The prolific also provides free demographic screening and they impose ethical rewards. The minimum, minimum hourly pay is $6.5. And that is important because if you expect people to spend 10, 15 minutes doing your survey and you pay them 50 cents, that doesn't sound very fair. So I think it's more and more important for us as researchers to consider what is a fair pay for enter or prolific for any of these online platforms. Now, reviewing a paper. So this is something that um, that I've been, uh, I, I, I'm trying to explain to my grad students. So obviously the one is a contribution, whether it's theoretical or managerial contribution, but the contribution needs to be there. That is the key issue. However, I think it's important to prioritize your comments. Distinguish between major and minor concerns. Because it's very frustrating as an author to get these uh, comments left and right, but you know, there's really no way of saying what's important, what's less important. Obviously, as a reviewer, you need to be very impartial and be diplomatic. There's no reason to, to insult people. If you, are, if you provide alternative explanations then as a reviewer, make sure that you are able to show how your alternative accounts are consistent with the data. And then please share suggestions for improvement in a precise manner. Not just say, oh, well, this paper is no good. That's not constructive, right? So here are some frequently asked questions that I get from my grad students. What if a paper is very similar to a project I'm currently working on? When you really actually go and read a paper, it probably is very different from yours. At first glance, it might look like, hey, this topic is very close to mine. But obviously, or most likely, the, the other researchers address this from a very different perspective. What should I do if, if I know who the authors are? My, my, <clears throat> my advice is to contact the editor and say, hey, I know the authors. I can't provide an unbiased review. What if you see something in the paper that is incorrect? Is it OK to ask a colleague about it? It is as long as you make sure that everything remains confidential. Okay. What should I do if I receive a paper that I reviewed already for another journal? Again, please contact the editor and say that, hey, you already reviewed this and it's up, up to the editor whether they want your review or not. How much weight should I place on statistical and methodological errors or inconsistencies? Obviously, these need to be flagged. If you see any inconsistencies or errors, they need to be flagged in your report. How should I deal with non-significant results for key dependent variables? Well, if it's a series of, let's say, five experimental studies, you want to look at those studies all together as opposed to just focusing on one, one uh, p-value of 0.15. So it's important to look at the, look at the studies holistically. So another one is how to respond to reviewers. How do I handle disagreements with reviewers? If there are theoretical disagreements, you really need to find very good arguments to counter argue. If they are just stylistic preferences, then I would go with whatever the reviewer wants. What do I do when reviewers disagree with one another? This is a terrible situation to be, I and mean, we've all been there, right? In this case, I would go back to the editor or the associate editor and ask for guidance. 
when is it okay to write the editor to ask for clarifications? It is completely okay. If there's something you don't understand, it's perfectly your right to go and go to the editor. Is it okay to ask for an extension? Sure, life happens, right? Sometimes such things happen and you can't get things done within that timeline. The last one is the editor rejected my paper. Under what circumstances can I write back to the editor and request another opportunity? Never, don't go there. Try to pull this, send it to another journal because that really is not good practice. So those are some things that I gathered over the years with my grad students. Some topics that keep popping up. Now, how about this COVID-19 impact? We all live in this world. More and more journals are having special issues on COVID. So that's obvious. There will be a lot of research coming out on COVID. And that has forced us into these virtual events. I mean, I wish I could be there in person and in front of you instead of this through this Zoom world. Will there ever be, will there be a return to large scale in-person conferences? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Like the grad, grad student conference this year was virtual. Not ideal, but better than nothing, right? Does this COVID-19 result in more data sharing given limitations in data collection? Hopefully so, that would be great. And the one positive thing is that for a lot of institutions, the COVID has given extra time on tenure track. So people are given an extra year, so that might help people. So this pretty much wraps up my presentation, but I want to share with you, first of all, thank you for listening and share with you the other passion I have besides research in my life, which is showing dogs. And here is one of my show dogs. So that concludes my presentation and thank you very much for listening. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Matilla. So, some excellent advice there. And I know I've got a few questions, but I, I'm going to start with a question which was actually going through my mind. It's through one of our PhD students, Maxim. Um, I'm going to read it out, Anna. But, uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. There is no doubt that interdisciplinary research brings new perspectives to hospitality and tourism research. However, it is not easy to invite researchers from other disciplines to collaborate on our research projects. And I know myself and Maxim speaking from experience. Could you recommend any tools, interdisciplinary meetings, networking, etc., to invite and motivate colleagues from psychology, neuroscience, medicine, engineering, etc., to actually work on our interdisciplinary studies? Any, any words of wisdom to, to assist us? Yeah, that's a very good question. Good question, and uh, and that uh, actually <clears throat> points to something that I just started to do work, work with the with the medical field, and I think the important thing is not to be shy. Go and contact people who think you think might have some interest in the topics that you have. For example, I did a paper, just finished a paper on telemedicine, and I asked for people from the health and policy administration to to be co-authors with me because there was a mutual interest. I looked at it from services perspective and they looked at it from a medicine, telemedicine perspective. So don't be shy, you know, you'd be surprised how, how, how many people are actually interested in what you're doing if you ask them the right question. Make sure that they have some interest in the topic as well. And can I just extend the question, Anna? Have you had any particular challenges with working anybody in other areas? In, in sort of culturally or the, the manner in which they work and how they think? It can be challenging because, you know, we are all based in our little silos, right? For example, if you want to work with, and no offense to finance people, but they don't go beyond regression, right? It has to be a regression method. If you ask consumer behavior people, they all want to do experiments. So, you know, a lot of us are somehow siloed with the, with the methodological issues. But you know, it's, on the other hand, it's just very eye-opening to work with others with different mindsets. That, that is certainly something I enjoy. Got, got a question from Arash, who's also one of our PhD students. Uh, again, thank you for the presentation. I'd like to know, what is your opinion about the use of secondary data in service management studies? 
and oh, it's sort great. of acceptability for publication, particularly in those higher level journals. Absolutely. If, you, if you're able to answer your research question with secondary data, the more power to you. Because then you avoid the problems of, of, uh, of data collection and the data is already there and they tend to be large data sets. So, you know, you can do all, the, all, all kinds of analysis. Okay, thank you. And a question from uh, Moji asking about, um, yeah, publishing in, a, in other areas, particularly uh, leisure related journals, which I've noticed over the years, they haven't quite grown in sort of impact as fast as hospitality and tourism. What, what would be your advice in terms of the more sort of leisure side of hospitality and tourism and suitable outlets for publication? It all depends on your research area. You know, that's where your research is and those are appropriate journals for you to publish in, by all means, go for it. I'm just scrolling down here. I'm actually going to ask a question about open access journals because I'm probably not alone here. Up until probably about a year ago, I was quite cynical about open access journals. Um, but in the work I do, I use a lot of material from the journal Sustainability. Mm -hmm. from MD Power, and it's really, really good. So I've sort of dug around and I'm pleasantly surprised as to what I'm seeing. I was just wondering, what, what's your take on the sort of perceived quality maybe and the actual impact uh, of, of these open access journals? Because they're certainly um, growing exponentially now. Right. I think they are at the very early stages of development, so their impact factors are not that high. But again, I think that is the way the future is going to go. For example, I get three, four requests for most open access journals to review every week. So, you know, you can see that they are really getting into hospitality and tourism as well. Ellen, can I do the follow-up? Yes, certainly. Tico, please, please jump in. That, which is um, more an ethical question, and I'm posing that to, to you, um, um, Anna, also to Ape. Um, it has to do with this ethical trade-off. If I see, for example, an open access and I pay for that article, that may give the impression that, you know, there is a, a compromise there, you know, because if you go on the free market, some people can go to the extreme and, you know, compromise the integrity of the process. So as, and it seems like, you know, a market of lemons in that respect, or it can become like that in the sense that you will have you know, integrity issues, and that will put a doubt on good quality um, 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 output of, 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 of or, or papers in that respect. So how, how, how do I have to imagine or, or see that future in terms of this ethical trade-off between payments and, you know, the integrity of the process? That's my first question. I would get to Dr. Pisani, he has more mm -hmm. experience than I. Well, here's the issue. The beginning of the open access uh, was not completely uh, fair and was not completely ethical. So people like yourself and even others uh, got the perception correctly that it is uh, pay for publish. And that perception uh, remained till today. Uh, however, some of the major journals have now moved to both options that you have open access and uh, regular access. Uh, the problem in that case is not necessarily that it is of lower quality if you go with the same journal and pay for it because the same process, the same procedure are maintained for both. In my opinion, the most difficult issue is that many good researchers cannot afford to pay a fee of $2,000 or more for publishing their article, even if it is a very high quality. They come from institutions that do not necessarily have uh, grants or have the ability to pay that for their faculty member and they end up in uh, a second class or you even uh, in third class publications because they simply don't have the money 
to pay. So that is an issue that needs to be addressed either at the university level or at the publisher's level, because the fees today uh, in good journals are pretty high. Can I, have a can, can I, can I just add, uh, uh, and you've actually got a, a country context in mm -hmm. this as well. So if you're publishing in the United Kingdom now, and you want to be included in the seven, I think it's every seven year evaluation of your research, you have to have your publications open access. So the British system has really changed in the past five or six years where the institutions will pay for your uh, materials to, to be published. And I think the reason that's significant, Britain's a small country, but it's where a lot of the publishers are based. A lot of them are based in Oxford and the surrounding area. So the, it's actually the traditional world that are beginning to shape things up a little bit in the open access world as well. So th things are, are certainly moving. Uh, Dr. Wong. I think, you know, on this issue, I think, you know, it would take some time for people to kind of either accept or voluntarily or involuntarily uh, the changes, right? But, you know, I think it is also research specific, you know, uh, if, I, if, I, if I think about open access journals, especially with payment structure involved, right? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't feel comfortable doing that because, you know, as if I perceive that as a process, as a transaction process, okay? So, you know, you want to publish in my journal, okay, you know, here's, Here's a, here's a price you pay, and then we'll get your uh, research published, right? So I don't feel comfortable at yet, you know, at, uh, at this level. But I have a follow-up question in terms of the utility of doing research. Um, so uh, that's, you know, related to the purpose and why we are doing research, right? When you, when you think about utility, of course, you think about, you know, the theoretical utility of research and the the practical utility of research. And the latter probably is a very, very important in our field, being an applied field, right? And, uh, but, you know, most of researchers when they conduct research, you know, um, they will only focus on one or the other. And that also affects their philosophy about, you know, why, you know, they are doing research. Uh, some of the researchers believe that, you know, uh, we are researchers, you know, we're supposed to, uh, you know, develop theory and make co theoretical contributions, right? Whether that will be uh, applied in the practical side, uh, that is not my responsibility. You know, my responsibility is to come up with uh, ideas. You know, I'm the creator. I'm the knowledge, you know, developer, right? Whether my knowledge will be picked up by somebody else, if they are smart enough, of course, you know, they will do. If they are not smart enough, well, you know, that is not uh, my responsibility. So there's a gap between this knowledge creation and the knowledge application, right? So uh, many times people will, uh, will argue that, you know, as a researcher, you have to take uh, both of these aspects into consideration. You know, you are the creator, but also at the same time, you also need to be the translator, so to speak, you know? how you are going to translate your theoretical or academic research into application, into practice, right? So there's always a gap, you know, in, in that, especially for example, if you go further action-based research, right? You know, the purpose of research is always intended to introduce change and make something happen, uh, you know, for, for, for the better, right? So what is your viewpoint of a, of a role of researcher, you know, we focus on this one, this one, or we should combine, you know, uh, both of them. Okay, that's a very good, <clears throat> good argument. And of course, we are in a very applied field. So I don't think we are doing theory development in hospitality, in, in, in a strict sense. So I think our research has to have some managerial implications, otherwise it's pointless, honestly. Okay, I, I, I'm going to uh, go to an old friend, so Jean Paolo. Uh, if you can hear me, Jean Paolo, to, uh, back in Portsmouth in the UK. Nice to see your question, Anna. As a uh, editor of a journal myself, and I'm sure you you get frustrated with this. One problem is finding good reviews that provide a timely review, <laughs> along with constructive and thorough comments. Any mm. thoughts on how we can change this trend? Because it seems to be getting more challenging 
year in, year out? And any thoughts? It's getting worse and worse. I mean, I was an editor of general hospitality and tourism research for five years, and it took a toll on my life. You know, it's like yeah. everyday process trying to find those reviewers. And, you know, and I understand, you know, on the other hand, as a, as a reviewer, you know, you have so many demands, you know, when you get 20 review requests every week, you just can't do it, right? So it's very, very hard. And I think the problem is that we have, in our field, there are more and more journals nowadays, so you get even more review requests. So, you know, people's time is limited. And then what do you offer, offer to your reviewers? All you can say, offer to them is your gratitude, nothing else. Right. So unless people really believe in the system and say, this is important, I need to help other people. I need to do the review and do it well. You know, it's a, it's a lost battle. I'd like to follow up on that one. And it's the, 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 the issue of transparency. Lately, um, journals are asking you whether can they publish your name as a reviewer? And I always said no, because I'm a strong believer in this uh, blind peer review. If my name appears several times, then people can really surmise, okay, he is going to review it. So it, 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 in my view, it compromise, compromises the, um, peer, the blind peer review. What is your opinion about that? And also for Ape as a former uh, yeah. journal editor. I think the double blind review process is very, very important. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, Tico, that if you know people figure out that, oh, these are the kind of articles you'll be reviewing, they make sure that you put your citations in there no matter what, right? Yeah. So I think the, it is an uh, integrity issue. I, and I agree with you. I never give my name. <laughs> uh, my, experience, hey. my experience with that is that we have the responsibility for giving credit to reviewers. I have received over the years a larger and increasing number of requests to give a certificate of review to a reviewers. And when I first saw that, I asked that individual, why do you need that? And they said to me that this is necessary for their annual evaluation for promotion and tenure. And since that time, we have the ability as, as editors or even uh, guest editors to issue a certificate to those people who really need it for promotion and tenure. That assures them that they will get credit for it. And in many cases, I've seen that being equivalent to a certain number of points or anything else of value when you do review. Uh, that alleviates to some extent that problem of finding reviewers. But it's still a major problem. As uh, Anna said, we have thousands and thousands of articles published every year. We have more than 400 journals and it is becoming a very difficult issue, even when you give the proper credit. Anna, uh, if I, I can have... ask a methodology question, I've got a question here again for Maxim, but it, it's a good question. What is your forecast about the future methodology in hospitality research? Um, and he just gives some example, big data analysis, framework, foresight, longitudinal study, biometrics. Um, is there any view on where you think methodology may go in the future? Obviously, it's going to be driven by big data analysis because we get more and more data available from different sources. So we as researchers need to equip ourselves with the skills to deal with that data. It's going to get more complicated, that's for sure. Oh, Anna, can I have a follow-up <laughs> question? Uh, Alan, can I have a follow-up question? Yes, of course. Right. Please follow up. Uh, so um, you talk about the um, interdisciplinary disciplinary research and... Um, you know, you're really um, one of the forerunners and a you know, great example of, of, of doing that, right? Um, but I, I, I don't know uh, what extra stuff it will take for us really to break that ceiling and encourage more scholars to do this kind of research so that we can be recognized and, and respected and accepted as peer researchers and scholars, right? I think, you know, yes, we can encourage more 
but I think you know it is also related to the structure of the program. Uh, if our program is uh, you know focusing on continuously focusing on just hospitality and tourism, and then we hire people, you know, of course within this uh, domain, right? The mindset has already been set, you know. So we are researchers in hospitality and tourism, right? It is very very difficult to encourage people to really think out of the box and do you know research in either borrowing ideas and concepts from other areas or to have you know research generated you know having applications in other disciplines or areas right and what do we, we do here is a little bit different you know we start also at the program level uh, you know we really expand the hospitality education into other areas of hospitality related you know we call it hospitality culture right so we have programs like senior living. We do research in healthcare uh, industry, uh, the sports. You know, we have people uh, who really come come from the sustainable sustainability background, technology uh, background, right? So you know, with this, based on our experience, you know, it really generates the kind of you know uh, culture and environment. You know, people are more willing, in which people are more willing to think about you know research out of their already you know defined domain of expertise so what is your comment on that i i agree with you it requires a lot of teamwork and to have that team culture that you know that you encourage people to look at things from different perspectives and it's not it's not something you can create in a day or two it's a long-term process mm -hmm. but another thing that i'm thinking that what, what i'm trying to sell and okay again you know if your promotion and tenure process doesn't give you credit for publishing outside our hospitality and tourism, it is a big problem. And I think a lot of hospitality and tourism programs face that, including Penn State. I don't think they really appreciate my publications outside hospitality as much as they should. Yeah. But um, one thing is, is that what I'm trying to sell to my former doctoral students is that, hey, you know what? If you publish outside hospitality, you get more citations and that can help your career. Mm -hmm. so if I look at my publication record, my, my highest cited publications, they are all outside hospitality. Yeah. But, you know, also we need to be more open within our own journals because, you know, our, our own journals, some of them are not open uh, to, you know, accepting uh, research out of, outside of the, uh, the hospitality, so-called hospitality industry, right? Even though the idea, everything can be related to, you know, hospitality, uh, leisure and the service. So I think, you know, we have to do something within our own journals. Absolutely, absolutely. Anna, can I ask you a question, which I'm sure when you first came to the US, this is probably an issue for you. This is Veronica who's asking, have you got any advice for researchers who are or traditionally non-English speakers? Because clearly there's, a, there's an additional hurdle. Yeah, it is, it is. And that makes writing more difficult. The only, uh, only advice I can give is just keep writing and writing and writing. You know, I don't think anyone, regardless of where they come from, are born with the, with the born skills to write academic papers. It is a skill you acquire. So the more you write, the better you get at it. But I would give a piece of advice if you feel like, you know, your writing is not your best asset, make sure you have your paper copy edited before you submit it in a journal. And I can't not ask, there's a few questions coming in on COVID. Clearly COVID is a sort of monumental challenge at the moment. Do you think journals and researchers have gone a little bit COVID overkill? Or do you think the sheer volume of papers out there that have been certainly been written at the moment are justified in terms of uh, the scale of the phenomenon? That's a tough question to answer. I mean, it's, it's such an terrible thing that the world that we're living in right now. But on the other hand, what is the long lasting impact? Unless you take a little broader view and look at crisis management as a topic, you know, I think COVID itself is very, very narrow. Yeah, I, I would like to add, okay. to that, uh, if possible. Uh, I'm currently a guest editor of IJHM on COVID. And I have received more than 700 papers to review on that. And more than 95% of them are rejected. And one of the reasons for this rejected, 
that they have no generalizability and no reproducibility. And that's a problem. Uh, if you concentrate only on the COVID phenomena without taking into consideration the lesson that you have learned and the applicability of your research to other crisis situation that might occur in the future, then it will be rejected because it becomes like a case studies. And some journals do publish case studies, but the majority of the journals want a real contribution to knowledge. And contribution to knowledge means that this can be generalized to other situation. And this is the Achilles heel for many, many hospitality and tourism researchers, even those who are not uh, in the COVID area, that their research is confined to a particular situation and it's not generalizable. I have another question um, about unintended consequences of the concept of transparency. I heard you say, Anna, about the, the trend that journals are requesting for you to uh, reveal uh, your data. Uh, and I understand that in the name of transparency, but it has an equity dimension, a trade-off. If I'm paying for my data, I do all the efforts and then I gave it to you and you gave it to others and they share in, in the benefit, but not in the cost, then probably the unintended consequence is that people will shy from those journals or start doing something else. Because I, 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 I for sure have denied two journals that I submitted and they requested that. I said, no, that's not fair. Unless you can tell me that the data is only for you as an editor, but you cannot do anything else with it. That's a different story. But just to put it out there for everybody to make use of it, I don't think that's equitable. And I think it's, it's a scary proposition and you know, it requires an enormous amount of trust. And you know, I just don't, in this internet world, I just, I agree with you. It's, it's very, very scary. Abe, hey, what do you think about that? Uh, again, it depends on the journal. And I would say that uh, quite a few journals request that and commit themselves not sharing it with anybody else with the exception of one or two reviewers who make sure that the data supports the results, that is not fudged, uh, that is uh, not manipulated. Uh, but the majority of the journals will give you that assurance if you are requesting that this data will not be shared with anybody else. And I might suggest that this was copied from uh, other scientific areas like physics, like medicines, uh, like chemistry and so on, where they wanna make sure that what you are claiming is actually in the data, found in the data. And we're coming to the end of the session, but my good friend and colleague, and obviously you know him very well as well, Febzi has asked a question which I'm sure everybody has been thinking. How do you manage your time? <laughs> okay, that's something that I learned as a doctoral student. Back at Cornell, when I was doing my doctoral studies, I had two babies. So I had no time to waste. I didn't have five minutes in a day to waste. So that forced me into being extremely, extremely careful with time management. And I think that has saved my life as an academic in my career. It goes back to that notion of time management. Even today, if I have five minutes, I don't waste it. Lovely. I hope that answers your question, Fevzi, but yes, it was one I'm, <laughs> work-life balance doesn't really fit, it's just keep going. Lovely. And I, I think, Tipe, if I can just ask one final question um, that came through from er, Ernie Laston. Anna, do you think there is a need for another type of category of research? We have quantitative, we have qualitative. Do you think with the trends that are open up, is there scope for another category of uh, research method? I mean, there's a lot of push for mixed methods and you know all that, which is all good. I, I, I fully agree. You should be looking at things from different perspectives, different methodologies. That's all good. 
So I think, again, that's another area where we see more and more sophistication. It would be more difficult. I, I see this in the mainstream marketing, for example. Trying to get things published with the three, four experiments is not good enough. Now you need to have some field experimentation or some secondary data to show that the phenomenon is there. So, you know, the, the more proof you have, the better off you are. Excellent. Lovely. Um, Dr. Matilla, excellent. Can I pass back to my colleague, Dr. Crows, who really found your, your answers very interesting. Uh, thank you. Great tips on time management. Thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you Alan. Thank you. thank you, Abe. Thank you, um, Dean Wong. At this point, I would like to conclude this interesting session thanking you for attending and a special thank, thank you to Dr. Anna Matilla for her wonderful presentation. We will see each other again at our next Abraham Pizam Distinguished Lecture Series on February 17, 2021 at 2 p.m. New York time with our special guest, Dr. Pauline Sheldon from the School of Travel Industry Management at the University of Hawaii. The title of our lecture is New Paradigms for a New Tourism. Thank you and please stay safe. Till the next time. At this point, I would like to conclude this interesting session, thanking you for attending and a special thanks to Dr. Anna Matilla. We will see each other again at our next Abraham Pizam Distinguished Lecture Series on February 17, 2021 at 2 p.m. New York time with our special guest, Dr. Pauline Sheldon